There's a difference between acknowledging and being honest and wallowing. And the reason why I don't think it's wise to wallow is because when we wallow, all we see is the hard and the bad and we equate the two. And when we acknowledge and then say, but what is a way out? We start to see solutions. We start to see that there are positive aspects of challenges. We start to see, man, I'm not nearly as prone to melt down over this hard thing because I worked through it in God's strength. My name is Lisa, mother of eight and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, we are having on a guest favorite, Abby from M is for Mama. She is an author, a podcaster, a blogger, and Instagrammer who encourages other moms with her experience of being a mom of 10, a Bible-believing Christian, married for I don't even know how many years, probably pushing 20 at this point. So she has a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience to share, and women all across the internet learn from her and are inspired and encouraged by her. And I know that you will be too. So let's dive into this interview. Abby, thank you so much for joining us again. I know the listeners always like hearing from you. And since you've been on my podcast last, actually, maybe since then you have had your podcast, but you have a new podcast, which is so much fun to listen to. We get such longer form content from you than we do on Instagram. So that's really great. For those who don't know you, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I am, and you and I go way back, so it feels funny introducing myself to you, but I know it's not for your benefit. (laughs) I am a Bible-believing mama of 10 kids. My favorite person in the world is my husband, Sean, and I have been on the internet for about 13 years, writing, microblogging, blogging, writing books. We have built a couple houses together. We homeschool. I do some fitness instructing on the side. Um, we have a couple of sets of twins, which is always fun. That keeps things really spicy at our house. And, um, yeah, we just, we are, we are never, ever, ever bored. I will tell you that. Yes. I have two less children than you and don't do a lot of those things that you do. And still my life feels like very, very full, never boring. That would be very interesting thing. When my kids come around and they look a little bit bored, I'm like, bored. Like, here you go. Like, I've got plenty of things for you to do. Yeah, I've There's got always for something for you to do. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. So in the later years, you have been most known for your books. So you have a, not brand new book, but you have a book called Heart is Not the Same Thing as Bad. You also have your first book. Is that, hold on. Is that just called Emma's Rama? Now I'm trying to remember, yeah. but yeah, I have read them both. They are both great. Tell us about your books. Yeah. So I wanted to be an author for as long as I can remember. I mean, I I can't remember a time even as a little girl that I didn't think it would be amazing to write books. And, um, I don't know at the time, I don't even think I cared if I got paid money to do it. I'm still not sure if I do. Yeah. (laughs) That's that's not why I do it. But, um, but just to turn words into stories, into something that could benefit and encourage and impact people, And I probably didn't think that deeply at like six, seven years old when I first was like, I want to be a published author one day once I figured out what that was. But the Lord brought it to fruition in his timing and in his way. And so I didn't get a publishing deal until I'd been on the internet for a good nine years or so. And probably had kind of maybe if not given up hope kind of thought, well, the Lord's just taking me in a different direction. You know, I'm just going to do this social media thing and encourage people with these little micro blogs. And then along came in this email and um, saying like, hey, what do you want to write about? Because we'd love to publish you, which was just like mind blown. Uh And by that point, it was the right timing for it because I knew what I wanted to write about because I've talked about this before a lot, but I do this Q&A every Wednesday called What Do You Want to Know Wednesday? And people tell me what they want to know every Wednesday to the tune of like 500 questions Questions, every Wednesday. And when you have those questions over and over again, it gets you this ability to put your finger on the pulse of Mm -hmm. the modern, uh, most people that follow me are Christian, but not all, but the modern mom who is just kind of out here drowning and hoping for a lifeline. And of course, you and I know that lifeline is God's word and his presence. And that's, that's going to be the bedrock from which I start every single suggestion, principle, piece of advice, encouragement, whatever is God's word and his truth. 
And so getting to share that, which is what I do in both of my books, I, the subtitle of them is for mama is a rebellion against mediocre motherhood. And it's this idea of the culture tells you children are a burden. The culture tells you to escape through things like shopping and wine and Starbucks addictions and that you're kind of entitled to complain about your kids because I mean, who wouldn't their pains, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm, And the Bible tells us something very different. There's a really different narrative that runs all throughout scripture that culminates. I think it's Psalm 127 and saying that behold, children are a blessing from the Lord and a heritage and blessed is he whose quiver is full of them. And so it's this, it's this totally countercultural thing. And I feel like it's the antidote Mm -hmm. to the drowning feeling. That when you flip that narrative in your head from, I'm a victim, woe is me, my kids are doing this to me, to I'm more than an overcomer in Christ, which is what the Bible tells us, and I've been given this privilege of stewarding these precious eternal souls, what could be more important than that? I don't want to escape that. I want to engage with that. I'll tell you a fun little side story. So I just found this fantastic account on Instagram. I can't, if there are numbers in her account name, so I can't tell you exactly what it is, but it's like catnaps with some numbers at the end. And I was like, go follow this girl. She's hilarious. She's a Christian homeschooling mom of four. She's just really quirky and funny and tells stories really well. And so I told people to go follow her. Well, she comes into my DMs and she's like, no way. I read your book. And let me tell you, I wanted to tell you this. If I ever ran into you on on the internet, she said, I, my handle used to be mediocre momming 101. And then I read your book. Oh, wow. And I was like, no, I don't want to be associated with that at all. And she's like, I used to do all these funny jokes, making fun of like the hard things in motherhood. And she's like, I've always loved my kids, but I was just falling, you know, basically falling prey to this idea that this is something that you have to laugh your way through. And there are lots of funny moments in motherhood. I'm Mm -hmm. not saying we have to be super serious and spiritual about everything. But I thought that was such a cool, tangible story. She was like, it made a material impact, all the scripture in there on my life. And I was like, nope, that's not who I am. That's not who I want to be. So um, I've gotten so many messages like that over the years. And it's such a blessing to me to know that God's word, of course, is living, active, powerful. And by including so much of it in that book, it's it's having an impact on on a generation of moms who really, I think, needed something different than the just really regular narrative. Hard is not the same thing as bad. It's kind of the next step after that. Like, okay, we don't want to be like the culture. What do we do Mm -hmm. with that? How do we face the hard of motherhood without drowning, I guess? Right. And I think it is possible. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a pushback sometimes on like, you know, the argument for the mediocre motherhood is just, you know, this isn't real. Like it's, it actually is hard. So why do you think it's not a good idea to wallow around in the hard aspects of it. Yeah. So the funny thing is I'm never going to be the kind of mom that's telling you that it's not hard. I have seen those accounts that are like, listen, you're just doing it wrong because if you were doing it right, it would just be easy. I'm like, no, 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 no. This actually is challenging stuff. Who's saying that? What do they have? Like one easy child. Like if I had my first child, she was actually really easy. I needed to like get humbled. You know what I mean? By a certain couple, you know what I mean? You know how it is. (laughs) Some kids are easier than other kids. Yeah. Well, I, I think there is certainly a mindset that says whatever my personal experiences must be what the world needs to experience. So if it's a mom that has one or two kids who are fairly compliant, that can feel very much so like I must be doing it all right. And the rest of the world just somehow is missing the boat. And a lot of times, if you do have that next kid, interestingly enough, my first was really challenging. My second was okay. mischievous. I, I thought his personality was fantastic, but he was mischievous. So you had to like stay on top of him. And then my third was easy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that you yeah, just so it's not always the mixes. first, second, third. Yeah, there's yeah. no formula. There's no for, And that is what I am constantly saying. There is no formula for one, producing some kind of perfect outcome for our kids. So I highly disagree with anybody that's mm-hmm. peddling that. But two, there are right. principles to live by that are right, good, and true. Mm-hmm. And when we are faithful to say, yes, this is hard. I'm not pretending like it's not. I'm not going to gaslight other moms and be like, well, you know, that's just your opinion. Really, it's just this easy gig and everything flows really well. That's I, yeah, that's just not my experience. And it's not anybody's experience that's being really honest about motherhood, I would say. Mm-hmm. But There's a difference between acknowledging and being honest and the word you used, wallowing. And the reason why I don't think it's wise to wallow is because when we wallow, all we see is the hard and the bad, and we equate the two. 
And when we acknowledge and then say, but what is a way out? We start to see solutions. We start to see that there is, uh, there are positive aspects of challenges. We start to see, man, I'm not nearly as prone to melt down over this hard thing because I worked through it and got strength. And now it doesn't, I mean, my second set of twins have been just as challenging. I write about how challenging my first set of twins were as toddlers. To be completely honest, my second set of twins has honestly been more challenging than my first set. And the first set was the one were the ones that really humbled me that were like, uh-huh. dude, this is, <laughs> this is really taking me under. Second set were honestly harder, but they didn't feel as hard because they had that perspective yeah. of having worked through. Yes. And if I hadn't worked through, then maybe I would have just done a rinse, wash, repeat, or whichever direction that's supposed to go. And then what was me my way through another set of twins, instead of saying like, oh man, I've got some tools that I've been equipped with because, because the Lord didn't allow me to wallow, honestly. Mm -hmm. What other things do you feel like made your second set? Like what other perspective shifts helped you to see your second set, even though they were just as hard? Cause I have similar, I don't have, I have twins, but I have similar examples of kids that were literally harder on the, the further down kids, but they were easier for me because of perspective shifts. Which other like perspectives do you see there? Well, I think we talked about this before, but having those older kids kind of inform your view of how long those stages actually last helps Ooh, so yes. much. <laughs> yeah. When you have a kid, mm-hmm. so for example, with my first set of twins who were relatively easy babies, extremely hard and emotional and histrionic toddlers. And then from then on, it was kind of a steady climb to more emotional stability, more others mindedness. You know. And now this is not always the end of the story. Like I said, I'm not giving you a formula, but now are some of the most um, generous hearted, sweet natured, just giving hard work. Like, like they just have this laundry list of incredible character traits. I couldn't see those when they were three and a half and losing their minds over shoelaces and food and car seats and anything they could possibly think of to lose their minds about, you know, those, those traits were not immediately evident. So it took walking through that fire and coming to the other side to see that I shouldn't be making judgments about my kids, their worth, their potential, their futures based on the hard that you're in right now. Right. So when you had, when you have it again, you're like, well, I'm not going to make any judgment calls about what's going on right now. (laughs) I'm going to find solutions. I'm going to pray a lot. I'm going to accept help when it comes. I'm going to appreciate restful moments, few though they may be. And I'm going to ask the Lord to give me more wisdom. But I know this is not the be be over and all like change is coming Mm -hmm. and I want the change to be good. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I think that's just it. I talk about that with homeschooling a lot too. The things I worried about with my older kids when they were little, how am I ever going to teach them this and this? And then once you're on the other side of it, you realize, okay, that kind of happens. Like in spite of what I might, my shortcomings or where I might fail, it still happens. And so having that perspective on the other end of it is everything. Yeah. It helps so, so much. Now, how do you encourage moms to have community? I think this day and age, we have all the connection in the world. There are people who feel connected to you. They read your, what do you want to know? Wednesdays, they read your books. They feel inspired by you. But how do you recommend that moms find real life people to share their lives with? And why is that so important? Yeah, I I think one of the main reasons why it's so important is that regardless of how transparent and real you and I are, or anybody else tries to be. And I think we both try to be, I think we both try to tell people our faults. Somewhat. I definitely am not near as transparent as I would be if you were my sister or my, you know, like, oh, 100%. I, you know, as I would with just on the internet. Yeah. Well, I think that's wise, but I mean, I think that I'm never going to t- tell someone that I'm naturally patient. I will tell you the Lord has grown my patience as a result of having so many children and having it tested so many times, but I'm not going to be like, listen, this is just who I am. I'm just Zen and I'm not Zen now. So, you know, I'm not going to try to convince you that you're talking to like a guru, but the thing is, even when you're not trying to convince people of any such thing, we have a tendency to put people on pedestals. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to dismiss the things that they admit to us as a fault, as she's just trying to be humble. 
And we paint this veneer of perfection when we don't even realize we're doing it. And we idolize people. I mean, I can do this too. Like, surely she doesn't deal with the same things I deal with. Oh, probably yes. Never I, I do too. Her, you know? And you're like, I know mm-hmm. this isn't true. I know this isn't true. Because you know it because this isn't yeah, true. You, you're, you're living it and, and you see you're your an internet person yourself. Yeah. And you exactly. know the things you show and you don't, but yet you still do that to other people. 100%. <laughs> so that's unwise because, um, the Bible has this verse where it talks about if we compare ourselves with ourselves, we're unwise, but instead we're supposed to compare ourselves to kind of the standard of God's word. The same would go true of anybody else. If we compare ourselves to the lady on the internet or even to the lady down the street that we don't see very often, who seems to have it all together with her high heels on and her lipstick on when she walks to the car in the morning, we're not supposed to live a life of comparison. And it helps not to live a life of comparison when you actually rub elbows with somebody in their everyday environment and watch how they actually discipline, (laughs) respond with patience or not, and then apologize to their children. When you have the ability to walk into their home and there's laundry all the floor because there's laundry downstairs by my, by my stairs right now, like that needs to be taken upstairs. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about it. It'll get taken upstairs. But if you walk into my house right now, you're not walking into some sort of pristine museum and someone might expect that from an internet image, but in real life, we know that's not how it works. So being able to be assured the mess and then the cleanup and then the mess again, the losing of the temper that inevitably happens at some point, And then the repenting and the confessing and the forgiving, like this is normal and good. Maybe not the losing of the temper, but I mean, we, we are working on our salvation. We're repenting. Trembling. We are being right. The <laughs> repenting part. Yeah. So important mm-hmm. to have those actual reminders of, um, well, and also I will say this, I have had people, you probably have too, that have messaged me and asked me to mentor them. And said, like, Mm -hmm. will you walk with me through life? And of course, I have to say no, sadly, because I don't have the bandwidth for that. We homeschool and I have deadlines and I have to clean a house and do that laundry that's at the bottom of the stairs and make food. And just my my time is pretty much taken up uh, other than what I offer on podcasts and in books and on social media. Like it's done. It's all gone. And so I'm always encouraging them to find somebody face to face. And they a lot of times tell me that they can't find anybody to say yes. And I've talked about this before on another podcast, but I think one of the reasons for that is that they're almost acting like they're proposing to a lover. It's like they're going up to someone and being like, I admire you so much. Can I have two hours of your your day every single week? And it's really intimidating. Like, it's like, oh, I don't, know. I don't know if I can commit. <laughs> it is, it's high pressure. Yeah. And so some of these Titus two women that they're approaching say no, because they're in the same place that you and I are all of their time is kind of taken. I think instead we would be really wise to one, look at offering value to other people before we ask them to pour into us. Like how can we be a good friend before immediately asking someone to fill up our cup? It's, it's almost mm-hmm. a really self-focused mindset to say, I need someone to right. make me be a better person. When we have at our fingertips, God's word, which tells us to be generous hearted, which tells us to look not only to our ne- own needs, but to the needs of others, which tells us to um, bear with one another in, you know, completely in gentleness and love and all these things to, to, to look outside ourselves and to be, to be asking to be poured into without thinking first in terms of what can I offer? How can I bring value? How can this be mutual instead of just a one-way street? Um, I see a lot of that. And I really want to encourage these young moms, especially who are looking for friendship and mentorship to look at themselves and say, I have a lot to offer too. I don't just need to take, I can give too. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I've seen it a lot on the internet where women will have this list of things and they'll say, where's where's my tribe? Where's our, you know, like they imagine that back in the day, mm. Everybody had all of this help. And they also think that you or, you know, everybody looked up on the internet must have so many people pouring into them. There must be a huge tribe behind them. And I think we're, we're spending too much time looking for that and waiting for somebody to come save us from the hard parts of motherhood. Mm. Well, and another thing that social media has done is it has made a quote unquote tribe look a certain way. 
There are the people going on girls trips to Palm Beach. There are the people wearing the matching twin sets. There are the people doing the cute reels together. And somehow if our tribe doesn't look that sexy or appealing, we are missing out sometimes on that quiet girl in the corner who is going to be our best friend if we will stop looking for our tribe and just go sit down and talk to her, you know? And um, Mm -hmm. you're right. We shouldn't be looking for an out, but man, community sure is nice. Help sure is nice. It's just not guaranteed. In fact, I'm literally writing my third book on motherhood. And I just wrote the sentence, something to do with like, it must be nice or it sure would be nice are two of the most joy stealing phrases in the world. Mm -hmm. because they keep our eyes so fixed on what we don't have instead of trained here right in front of us on all this potential and concrete work we have to do in front of us. Yeah. And it just doesn't help. It might be true. There, you know, nothing's fair. There are people who have a lot more. There are people who have a lot less. It doesn't help to think it must be nice. And I, I sometimes get questions and comments from people that, when I read it, I'm I'm thinking you're wanting me to say, you're wanting me to say, you can't do this. You want me to give you an out. You want me to give you an excuse as to why Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. shouldn't have to do X, Y, Z, whatever thing you're asking me about. And I think, well, how does that help for me to admit that it would be much harder for you to do this certain thing? I think sometimes, yeah, we're not, we're, we're waiting for somebody to step in instead of us to reach out and build that community. Yes. I'm going to give you a very small example of this, which I absolutely loved because when people get, when people ask me questions, either just in DMs or whatever, but usually what do you want to know Wednesday? When they ask me like, well, how am I supposed to do this? If I have these circumstances, X, Y, Z. Right. Um, and they want you to tell them, give them an out. Yes. They, they want a formula. Yeah. They either want an out or they want, they want a prescription for how to duplicate something mm-hmm. they see you doing. And you said something at the beginning of the podcast. And I think I've said this back to you every single podcast we've done together. You said, well, I don't do a lot of those things. And I'm immediately like, oh, 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 but you do a whole lot of things I don't do because you and I have some similarities in personality and character. And then we have very different ways that we apply them. Like our priorities are similar in children and um, blogging and um, homeschooling, but then it diverges so much. And I think that's so cool. And so I'm always really wary of people that are trying to be like, okay, what's the copy paste? Like, give me, give me that prescription. Mm -hmm. So I uh, remember that my friend Angie from this gathered nest Mm -hmm. was talking about how they have this hobby farm. They keep acquiring all of these animals. It's the cutest thing. It's so fun to watch. Yeah. And I DM'd her and I was like, didn't you say that you guys travel? Um, And she was like, yeah, we love to travel. And I'm like, so how does that work? Because we're looking at getting a horse. And it was like the boarding and the, the, you know, expense and the trouble of finding someone to watch them. It was like, well, we would probably would never take any trips if we had this horse. So how do you make that work? I love that she didn't try to pussyfoot around and give me some sort of caveat this. She said, Oh, we have family that lives close by and they take care of our animals when we leave. So that's how it works for us. It wouldn't work for everyone. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And I was like, I love the straightforward honesty of that. So I've started doing more of that instead of saying, here's how you can have the situation that I have. I will say my situation is different from yours in that I have this. If you don't have this, it may not be that you can have this particular outcome. However, there are probably things that you have that are different than mine that you are able to do Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't be able to pull off. And sometimes when you tell people that directly, it helps to reshape a mindset that was no fair that she gets to, to what do I have that works for me? You know, which, which is way more life-giving than keeping your eyes out there peeled for the person that yeah. has a better off yeah. than you do. It just, yeah, it's, it's just not helpful. And I agree with you. I like those straightforward answers. Now, Angie, she's an influencer online. And so she's probably dealt with these kind of questions so many times. She's like, I know how to answer this. You can't, I can, I have family. All right. <laughs> no <Yeah>. apologies. <laughs> yeah. 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 So in our culture, yep. we believe that easy is always better. And I've been sort of thinking lately about even like ordering groceries. I'm totally a believer in ordering groceries, but lately I'm like, man, I wonder what I'm missing out on going to the grocery store. Just certain things. I'm like, <laughs> is this better? So yeah. <laughs> now that might not be a very good example, but let's talk about that. Like how has our culture groomed us to believe that easy is the best? And then what's the problem with easy? 
Oh my goodness. So one, I want to say that easy is not always a problem. We talk about, you know, right. Psalm 23, he leaves me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He puts, sets a banquet before me. There's, there's this idea that the Lord absolutely gives us re- seasons of rest. And there's, I think it's in Peter where it talks about he refines and then he restores and then he refines and then he restores us. There's like this cycle in life of we struggle and then we get to breathe for a little while. And then we struggle and we get to breathe for a little while, but it's not just straight, smooth sailing. I think that Satan really wants us to believe that the straight, smooth sailing is the only way we can do be doing life, quote unquote, right. We have the manifesting uh, kind of new age, name it, claim it culture that's really blowing up right now. I'm going to manifest only good days. I'm going to manifest fortune. I'm going to manifest it. What's that? You may not have heard this, but there's this viral song going around about like, I want a man in finance, six foot five and blue eyes or something like that. And it's like, this is what I want in <laughs> I life. Know. You know, this is, yeah, it's just, I think yeah. for whatever reason, Instagram thinks I want to see every reel that has yes. this audio on it right now. So it keeps popping up. <laughs> and, um, but I was like, but that is literally what is wrong with our culture. It's not, if we're talking about marriage, for example, it's not, I want a man of character who works hard and loves the Lord, who will be devoted to his family and faithful to his wife and generous hearted to others. It's instead like this weird ideal of success, which is so superficial. Cause again, if we're just going with that silly song, you might end up with your six foot five guy in finance with blue eyes. Who's not faithful, never comes home at night and isn't a very nice guy, you know? Right. So that might seem easy because you're going to have this cute guy that provides everything for you. And then you find a lot of heartache on the other side. Um, Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on where your easy comes from. Does your easy come from your flesh and your focus being on how can I pave the way for everything to be prosperous and comfortable? Or does your ease come from those times where you're like, thank you, Lord, that the baby actually slept tonight. You know, that's not a bad ease at all. Um, and then what you were saying, because I have this little blurb that they pulled out literally in Heart is Not Same Thing as Fed that says grocery pickup is life changing. Um, so it was funny that you were saying, did you say grocery delivery? I can't get grocery yeah, delivery. Yes. I, I'm, I've tried so many times. They're like, we do not offer that in your area. And I'm like, okay, Lord, fine. I'll drive to the store yes, and have people I'll drive there. my car. <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, but I do think that there are times that we are bypassing interaction with humans mm-hmm. or yeah. pushing ourselves a little bit um, mm-hmm. that do rob us of opportunities to minister to others. I don't, I'm not ta- I'm not picking on grocery delivery at all, but those, Me those times I'm when still the doing spirits, it. yeah, <laughs> I'm still doing it. But those times when the spirit starts pricking your heart, like you, you could probably stretch yourself a little bit. You, you could go a little farther. I, I bet, I bet you could handle it you know, and we're like, Oh, but I don't want to, cause that sounds hard. I think those are the times where we really have to say that's probably conviction and we should do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I've been wondering about that with the, a lot of things are so easy with our phones and I'm like, am I replacing this time that I would be getting groceries with something that I say I prioritize, or is it just in an effort to get more done, be more productive? What's the thing I'm trading and is that worth it? That's the kind of things I've been thinking about lately. Man, that's some deep thoughts. Well, and just, <laughs> man, our, our easy lifestyle is not benefiting us in a lot of ways. I just took one of my kiddos mm-hmm. to an oral myofascial appointment to see about some airway issues and some jaw development issues. And she was just talking about how, one, the toxins we're putting in our bodies through the food that we eat, but also the type mm-hmm. of food that we're eating, like lots of applesauce and acai bowls and soft bread and things like that aren't developing people's jaws. And then they're having Mm. like airway problems. And this is why people, you know, end up on CPAP. It's like this weird snowball. Whereas something as simple as a hundred years ago, they had to chew a lot more stuff, you know, and it, it's how our, (laughs) it's how our, that is funny. They didn't have blenders. (laughs) Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They weren't just drinking their breakfast every morning. Um, and so that sounds like such a silly example, but Mm -hmm, but it's not like you never have a smoothie or anything, but just even that idea of all of these conveniences that we have provided for ourselves come with a cost, man, Mm -hmm. it makes you think. It it really does. Just because when I was a early mom before I had a smartphone or anything like that existed, I loved going out and about with my little kids. Now, 
granted, I no longer have a couple of little kids. So there is that as well. But I loved like going to all the grocery stores and saying hello to the cash register lady and like going into a little produce yeah. shop. And my oldest or my second oldest daughter, she loves, she's very much an extrovert. She likes to go to do things. And she hates that we, she hates grocery delivery because it means that I can be in for literally a whole week and never leave my house. Now I don't, yeah. especially in the summer, I don't really do that because we've already gone places this morning. As soon as I'm done with you, we're going to the pool. Like we're doing yeah. stuff, but just like the simple things like errands that I don't have to do anymore at all. It, I'm like, what am I, what am I missing here with all of that? Is this an easy yeah. is not better situation? Could be. And I think the answer is going to be different for every scenario and every person, but that's why instead of adopting this wholesale, if it's hard, it's bad. And if it's easy, it's good. Mm -hmm. Mindset is probably not a good idea because it causes you to not question those things and not to have those conversations between you and the Lord where you're like, okay, I, all right, I hear you. I should probably just go do that hard thing, uh -huh. you know, because you keep telling me I should. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk natural skincare. I have been trying to source natural skincare for probably a decade now. In the beginning, it looked like mixing up cocoa powder and shea butter and trying to make my own DIY foundation. That's a possible option if you want to go that route, but I did struggle to get something that worked for my skin and made me look like I was actually wearing makeup, but also quality ingredients. And that is where Tubes & Co has really come into my life and filled that need. So Tubes & Co is a small family owned company made in America that uses simple, wholesome ingredients for your daily wellness routine. So from your skincare, whether that's cleansing or moisturizing, toning, they have something for all of that to makeup. So I really enjoy all of their makeup products. I love that they use 100% natural organic ingredients like tallow, aloe vera, cold pressed olive oil, never any synthetic chemicals, GMOs, toxins, fillers, artificial colors, or fragrances, but then also high quality. I actually feel like I have great skincare and I'm not compromising just because we're using healthy organic ingredients. Your skin is your body's largest organ, so it makes sense in that situation to use something organic and quality if you are also taking seriously cooking from scratch and sourcing things for your kitchen this is a logical next step and i have found it very difficult to find quality products until i found tubes and co tubes and co is offering simple farmhouse life listeners 10 percent off your first order by using my code farmhouse over at toopsandco.com. So that's T O U P S and co.com. Use the code farmhouse. It'll also be linked in the description box or the show notes below. Okay. So a lot of moms today are drowning. They are so like their schedules are so full. They're just making it how have you seen that perspective shift? Why do you think that is that so many moms today are drowning more than maybe they were 20 years ago? I have my own thoughts on it. I'm actually like at, right before getting on with you, I was voicing over a video kind of about this, just how it seems like we have so many more conveniences today when it comes to, we have a machine that does our dishes, does our laundry, but then in a lot of ways, we're drowning more than ever. What perspective shift do we need here? Oh man, um, that is of oh, golly, that's a huge question. But I feel like I think you asked kind of yeah. why do you think that is? I think it's because we can press a button on our dishes and walk away and go do three play dates and a hockey practice and all these things. Yeah, we have too much time. Yes. Um, and then we have a lot of pressure. One of the main, and I know you get asked this question too. One of the main questions I get asked over and over again is how could you possibly spend enough time with 10 children? I think it's a laughable oh, question. Oh, I get asked it nonstop. Right. I think it's yeah. a funny <laughs> question because of how much time I do spend with my children. So mm -hmm. up yeah. to this point in my day, other than talking to you, I have either been doing breakfast and Bible reading. Oh, I did take the kid to the appointment today. So I was just with one child. And then I have made lunch for small children, talked to, I mean, any number of combinations of kids, but we have been made. And, and so to me, it feels natural. I'm constantly interacting with some either a one-on-one -on -one interaction or a small group, group interaction or a couple of my kids, or we're all together reading or whatever it looks like all day long. 
most days. Yes, I run errands. Yes, I teach fitness classes. I'm not in and out of the house, but for the most part, most of my time is spent at home. And so one, that's not true of the typical American family. Mm -hmm. Most of their time is not spent at home together. So I would say that homeschooling helps with that. And if you don't homeschool, you're going to automatically kind of fight that um, dynamic of the amount of time your kids are out of the house. And that's going to be something you have to adjust for and prioritize for sure. But then the other thing that it's embedded in that question of how could you possibly spend enough time with your 10 children is an assumption that we have the kind of schedule that's being set forth in sitcoms and oh, on yeah. news shows. And so they're overlaying this idea that all 10 children are in multiple activities every single day and gone from my home for most of the day. So then it's like, well, how in the world could there be any time left? But instead we've been really intentional to either group our activities because our kids do things. They do piano lessons. They do soccer. They do basketball. We, we make it work as a family, but that last part as a family is really key. And Mm -hmm. so we're not only working together as a family at home to make sure that the house isn't completely falling apart. We're not drowning all the time. But we're also doing a lot of activities, leisure and even sports. And, you know, my my oldest or my second oldest actually can drive now and is in our homeschool league for basketball, which plays surrounding area schools that aren't they're not homeschooled, um, private and little small public schools. And so he can drive himself. But at a local game, we're all going to go, you know, right. and that's an activity for the day. But we're still together and mm-hmm. we're not drowning. It's a good experience, you know. So one would be kind of look at where your hours are spent and two kick out the door, this expectation that every member of the family has to have five different activities going on at the same time. They just don't. And it is sucking you dry. Uh I I don't recommend. Absolutely. Yeah. We ended up not signing up for baseball or soccer this year just because we felt like the kids that were in it didn't care about it that much for the trade-off. And so I'm with you today. I have this little two hour block, one to three, that this is it. And I, this is all I got. But when people see you, when they see me, it's when we're doing this. And so it kind of looks like this is all you do. But actually this morning, you know, I've been with the kids literally all day. I'm sitting here for two hours and then I'm the second we're done, I'm getting up, putting the kids in the van. We're going to take them to the pool. So yeah, I think it's, it is, it's also hard when you don't have the same family, like we talked about earlier, everybody's in different, st- different circumstances, different situations. It, you kind of take your situation and then you put it on them. Like, 100%. well, if I had 10 kids in my situation, yeah. this would not work. Right. I would not have time for any of right. them, but you're just living a whole different life. And so we just cannot compare. I guess that's kind of the, the big theme here that we're talking about. Well, and, and it is the comparison a lot of times that drives people to take on things that they wouldn't even have necessarily done if their friend wasn't doing it or if their mom didn't expect them to like, we can politely say no to that kind of pressure. Even if it's the pressure we're putting on ourselves, politely say no to yourself Mm -hmm. because you don't have to be rude about it or be like, that's not what we do. Sorry, but our way is better. You know, you don't have to be that way at all, but you can acknowledge, like you said, that's working for them and they have a different family dynamic, but it would not work for us and it would not be wise. It takes a lot of confidence and a lot of maturity to recognize that because man is the pressure there big time. Yeah. And in our culture, we tend to see people speaking very poorly of children, especially teenagers. I know you've talked a lot about this and how much of a blessing teenagers have been. Yeah. I can say the same. I now have two teenagers. Talk about that. Like why, why does the culture act like children are the worst? I've, I've had some interactions in public that are quite eye-opening. <laughs> like, yeah, you really think this about children. You were also a child. Yeah. If we can't v- value children in our culture, what, what can we value? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I do like to talk about the blessing that teens are while acknowledging that it's a tricky face. How old is your oldest? She's 15. Okay. Yeah. You're getting there. So yeah, we're new. We have a 15 and a 13. Well, and, and I mean, you're in it, but as you see them getting older and older, there's definitely a transition to the peeling back of the parental authority and becoming more of a mentor and a guide. You hold those hard and fast things. Like someone was just asking me on the, what do you want on a Wednesday yesterday? Like, what are your screen rules? And I said, we don't have screens in rooms. 
And that applies to my 18 year old son that still lives at home with us because it's our house rules. So if he lives in our house, he obeys the rules and he understands that. And he doesn't, he doesn't care at all. He's like, I mean, and I, I always say this, like he'll go to the bathroom and I'll find his phone in the hall because the bathroom door is closed. So he can't have the phone in there, that kind of thing. And so, okay, yeah. Yeah. So I think, oh man, the, the problem is it's not even a problem, but the thing that makes it hard is that especially with when you start getting to the older kid range, it's a start as you mean to go on kind of thing. So I'm getting a lot of questions from people who are like, my 17 year old doesn't obey any of our house rules. And he calls me an mf -er. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So the problem is <laughs> that <laughs> you are wanting to start something at 17 which needed to happen at three. I'm not saying that that kid is too far gone and that the Lord can't redeem him. I'm saying the fight is an uphill battle at this point. And so we have to recognize, oh boy, you get heat for saying this because people are like, oh, it's not my, you know, it's not my fault. It's not, well, we have to recognize this incredible responsibility we have at an early age to say like, I am right now investing in my future elementary kid, future middle schooler, future high schooler, instead of being like, I'm going to hide from the three-year-old because he's too much work. Mm -hmm. Instead, he won't always be a three-year-old. Someday he's going to be a 13-year-old and I want to enjoy him when he's 13 too. So I'm going to lay the groundwork now. I'm going to hang in here with the hard now so that at 13, because I have people, I have a 13-year-old girl, a 16-year-old boy and an 18-year-old boy. And I had people before Della turned 13 was like, listen, Teenage boys are different than girls. Just wait till you have a teenage girl because the just you wait mentality is just rampant in our culture. Just you wait until you have kids. Just you wait until they're toddlers. Yeah. Just you wait until they're preteens. I have a 13 year old daughter and she is right. delightful. She is not without her faults, but she is not any more inherently right. awful than teenage boys. And a whole huge part of that is the groundwork that we started laying. Now, again, you're like, wait, you said there was no formula. I agree. There's not. And we have hit some bumpy roads during our teenage years. There have been some hard things to work through. There has been rebellion. There have been disagreements. There has been disrespect. It's going to come at some point. And to some extent, it's part of the process of their growing and learning. They push those boundaries because they're starting to see some freedom and right. you have to figure out by God's grace, which boundaries to hold and which ones to say are reasonable to start to let go and to loosen up on. And it is a learning process, which I am sure I will still be learning with my last teenager as he's leaving the house. So I, you know, I don't claim to be an expert by any stretch just because I have three teenagers, but I do know for a fact that I like all three of them, that I believe them to have great potential that I am very proud of the work the Lord is doing in their lives and that they are not inherently some yeah, stage to be yeah. afraid of. And in general, children are a blessing and the work that you do with your children and that you do mm -hmm. for your children in raising them, this is not something that is worthless. This is worth yeah. your time. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Just that this will bring joy and purpose and that this is good stuff to be doing to put our attention to. This is what my entire, this is entirely what my new book is about. Like literally it answers the question. So was it all worth it? Like was, did you, you know, did you really feel like all of that effort paid off? And I feel like the answer is going to be yes to some extent, but the real answer, and I'm just, you know, I don't even have to borrow the bother to buy the book now, but the <laughs> real should. answer is, <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't matter if it pays off and results in your children. If you are walking in obedience to God, he has declared children a blessing. He has called us to take up our cross and follow him. He has called us to um, raise our children, children up in the teaching and the admonition of the Lord. He has called us to impress upon them his ways as we walk, sit, lie, and stand, like it talks about in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8. If he calls us to do those things, then it is worth it to obey him. Even if the and results aren't the yes, same. Yes, I do believe. As somebody else's results. Yes, 
Yes, a hundred percent. Yes, because I have friends who have faithfully walked in all of these. I've seen it too. And right now they have a child or two that are just that are disobeying the rebellion, they're adults, and they have chosen a different path because guess what? It's not a formula. They are sinners who need Jesus and they have to own their faith for themselves. We are responsible to teach it, but we can't guarantee that they will take it. So I do see some people kind of peddling that formula Mm -hmm. of, well, if you just do it this right and you're this consistent, then, and you mix in some prayers and you're consistent to add a dollop of this, that, or the other, well, then out pops this really compliant, godly Uh adult. And we do know that there are principles that we follow because um, they are righteous and they lead to more righteousness, but often they lead to more righteousness than us. Right. And we pray that they do in our children, but man, we see some results in us a lot of times before we see results in our kids. Yes. And that's all you can really be responsible for. Like you said, it's not, it's not fully up to you. And I have seen people that I followed years ago in the early part of my parenthood, I've seen their children grow up and I've seen it work out for some and not for others. But the result, like you said, that is not the metric of if you actually were obedient and prayerful and walking in the Lord that whole time. So yeah, Yeah. I think, I think that's encouraging because if you feel like it's all, everything's up to you, which is something that we can think this day and age, because we get so much information. We research down to literally everything that we touch, that we interact with. We can make it feel like the pressure is 100% on us, which is way too much pressure. Yeah. And I think that that's an encouraging thing for moms to know that it's not. Yeah. Well, and I see, I see a version of parenting being peddled really strongly that talks about, um, connection with kids kind of being the ultimate goal. And, um, the other day I ran across an account that was basically saying that one of her children who is a legal adult, but still lives in the house had failed to text before coming home, but typically didn't do that kind of thing. And so she was just giving a whole scenario of how she dealt with that without any punishment or anything, any consequences, because it was all about connection. And honestly, in this particular instance, with her outlining a kid that typically didn't do anything like this, there would have been punishment or consequences on our side too. It just been like, okay, Hey, what happened? You know, a good conversation. And then going forward, you would know kind of, Hey, unless you text, we're going to need a whatever. But The main thing that I thought was interesting is that in the comments, people were like, well, what if you have a kid that's consistently disregarding your instructions and not communicating? What if you have this? What if you have that? In other words, problem children, because this girl didn't sound like a problem child at all. It was just a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. This woman was literally, Lisa, this blew my mind. This woman was literally coming in and saying, if you have a strong enough connection with your child, they will do it. Mm -hmm. Like it was, yeah. Yeah. Like you can control people and Mm -hmm. the kind of pressure that places on parents, because while yes, we are called to love God and then love people. And if we love people well, we very likely will have a good connection with them because we're being kind to them because we're taking care of them. Well, because we're being long suffering because we're having fun with them. Yeah. All those things are really good. But to say that as long as that connection remains strong, they will then obey you and do what you, oh, man, that is setting up a parent for heartache who is pouring herself or himself out for his child and then watching them stomp all over their desires and their hopes and their best efforts and thinking, well, it must be because I didn't bend over backwards enough for connection. You know, instead you say, I'm going to trust myself uh-huh. to a just judge who judges rightly. Um, I had a friend. Right who was talking about, she actually hasn't had any of her children stray, but she was talking about a friend of hers that did, who said something so profound. She said, I was talking to this friend whose, whose kids were struggling, older kids were struggling. And I was saying that was one of my biggest fears. It's one of mine too. I think it's every mom's fear that your child will reject everything you poured into them, that it will all been quote unquote for nothing. And so she said that friend said to her, Christy, listen, my child is not walking with God right now. And that hurts my heart, but it hurts my heart for the sake of the God that he is rebelling against, even more so than for the sake of the human that's doing the rebelling. I love my child more than anything, but I'm way more concerned about his rebellion against God than his rebellion against me. And I was like, okay, that'll preach. Because a lot of times I think our concerns are mainly about like our emotions and how we feel about it or how we would look to our community, you know? Um, it's pretty self-focused, but it's hard not to be. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. 
Now, your husband, Sean, he contributed to each chapter. I don't think we hear about the dad's role in this because, and not to say that like it's mostly women on social media, but most women follow other women, other women mentors on social media, and we rarely hear from the dad's perspective. So tell us a bit about this. So the same parenting movement that I was just describing that is really big on connections is also a very, very female-led, female-centric parenting movement. And mm-hmm. it's very big on social media. So I'm seeing yes. like it goes like, peaceful parenting, conscious parenting, gentle parenting. It's yep. very, I watched very you female-centric. Do a, sort of a debate with, um, I forget what podcast it was on, but I saw it popped up on my Ellen YouTube Fisher. and I watched it. Ellen Fisher. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I think one of the reasons we're seeing so much of this is one, you're exactly right. Women follow other women. And I think that makes sense. Uh-huh. Two, I, I do think most of the accounts on social media that are really large are, are primarily women. We are communicators. We are content producers. Like that's kind of what we do. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of naturally good at this creating thing when it comes yeah. to communication. So that kind of makes sense. But we also are missing a huge component of the family dynamic when we take out the leader of the home and don't, because I have so many moms that come to me and say, um, my husband is not on board with how I want to discipline or how I want to parent. How do I get him to do what I want? Right. (laughs) And my answer of course to them is you don't, Mm -hmm. that's, that's the wrong question to be asking. That's you're flipping it around. This is not, you have done all this research and read all these books and, or let's be honest, You've watched all these reels Follow on this particular media. parenting yeah. account. <laughs> <TikTok>. um, <laughs> yeah. And you've, yes, you've basically informed your parenting with social media, which is a funny thing to say when I'm on social media and I talk about parenting, but I'm always trying to bring it back to God's word. I know. Yeah. Um, I, I, I say these kind of things all the time too. And it's like, yeah, somewhat ironic, but also like this still is the encouragement to get off of social media and yeah. Go apply from. these principles that actually matter. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Don't, yes, don't get yes. like, like, listen to me, tell you to go read God's word and then actually go read God's word. Don't stay here. Don't stay here. And then go, go read go it. Go yeah. Bible. <laughs> yes. And go read it. Exactly. So, so I do think we're missing a huge, huge component when we kind of roll our eyes at these dads, like you listen, they're just not, they're just not enlightened. They haven't caught up yet with how we're actually supposed to be parenting. Right. <laughs> and instead say, what if this seemingly backward way of approaching communication, discipline, um, consistency, follow through all of those things is not my husband being a doofus, a clueless person, but instead a very necessary component of the balance between the male and the female dynamic that ideally every child has in his or her home. Um, the way that God has ordained it. One man, Mm -hmm. one woman, bonds of marriage, being fruitful, multiplying, having children, and then being faithful to invest in them, God's word and his character and his truth going forward. I think it takes both. And we need to be really, really careful that we aren't saying you're doing it wrong. Please be quiet. Scooch over. Let me get in here and be an expert. Because I mean, if you're in, if you're in a traditional dynamic, where the husband is the main breadwinner, you're probably spending more time with your children and you probably do feel like more of an expert. And you probably do feel like he's just blundering into your rhythms and your routines. If you're doing the vast majority of the child rearing, the bottom wiping and the teaching and the, you know, habit developing all that. But uh, man, those dads are so essential and they do have wisdom and their different ways of doing things is so valuable Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, I loved, loved, loved that Sean got to come in. It's just a little thing at the end of each chapter, but I get so much good feedback about the dad thoughts because people are like, guess what? My husband is reading this book, which has a lot of principles for everybody in it because there's a male voice. Right. And I think we need more of them, honestly. Yeah. Men miss out on that community encouragement. I think a lot. I noticed there's not as many places for them to go. And also our culture, I don't think understands the value of the, like you said, like the male and the, the, what they add. So, you know, my husband does things with the kids that I think are dangerous, you know, not like people don't freak out, nothing (laughs) terrible, but you know what I mean? Things that I would rather him not climb that high. When I look out the window, why are you you letting them do that? (laughs) But he, you know, that's the thing. The male tends to 
interact with kids in a very different way than the mom. And they've taken those calculated risks and they've, you know, they, they, he loves his children. He's assessed this and he is bringing value in so many more ways than that. But that's one of the things that I see that men tend to do just everything very differently. Yes. I saw this really interesting little clip of this person who was not a Christian and she was talking about it from an evolutionary perspective, but she said something cool about moms and dads. She said they have found that children and dads experience the most dopamine spikes like rush of endorphins, happy feelings when they interact through play or Mm -hmm. like wrestling or, or like physical interaction. Yeah. And children experience children and moms experience the most of those things when they interact through nurturing, cuddling, sitting on a lap, that kind of thing, reading to them. So I would encourage the moms that are mad because their dad or the husband came home and immediately gets on the floor and rolls around. This lady was saying like, look, this is how we've managed to evolve to survive (laughs) or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I want to go like, no, this is how God designed you. Do not resent your husband for getting to be the fun one because that is forming a bond that is so powerful that all of your love and care throughout the day is forming just as powerful of a bond, but in a different way. Like don't resent the the very different ways that God has designed us. It's funny how naturally, I, I'm sure it's a little different with each family and with each personality, but it's funny how natural it is for the kids. Like in the morning, they come up to me. They want, you know, they all want to sit on my lap. They all want to have kids all over me. And mm-hmm. then when we go to a pool or we go on a hike or whatever we do, it's that same, like instantly they're playing with, with Luke, like they're on him and they're fighting and they're just, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's just so natural how that all happens with kids. Which is funny because I don't want my kid to climb on my back and punch me in the head. Like, like I'm like, no. stop, come on. You know? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, I don't like to play. I don't mind cuddling. I don't like, I don't mind when they all come sit on my lap. That's fine. But I don't, I don't want to like in the pool, like push me under and we'll see how long daddy can stay under while know, we're all standing on I his know. back. And then we knock him off. Like, just, it's not my favorite thing. All right. Well, tell the listeners where they can find your book and follow along with you and the encouragement that you bring to the internet. Yeah, you can order a signed copy of either of my books from msformama.net, M-I-S-F-O-R-M-A-M-A.net. And you can also find it pretty much anywhere else books are sold in person or online. Um, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook uh, on Instagram. I'm m.is.for.mama. I also have a podcast of the same name to make it easy where I address a lot of those FAQs that I get every Wednesday. So if you have a question about a momhood thing, motherhood thing, whatever, I've probably addressed it on that podcast and we're still doing that weekly. We just actually took a break for the summer. I don't know when this is going to air, but it'll be back in the fall. And I, that's probably one of my favorite ways of interacting with people. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Abby. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much. As you can tell, I'm dressed differently than I was in the interview. That's because we were rushing out to go to the pool. We were meeting up with my sisters at a certain time. So this is very much how uh, stuff happens around here. Busy, do a quick interview, back out again. That's what it's like uh, in probably all families, but especially a large family. There seems to be just so many things going on. So I'm sitting down today just to do a quick intro, outro. I really love this conversation with Abby. I texted her afterwards and said, thanks for coming on. I have been hearing about your book in the wild in real life. So many people have mentioned the book. I've come across it in unrelated circles and topics. So I know that her books are encouraging women everywhere. Moms everywhere are reading it for them. But her most recent book that we're talking about, Hard is Not the Same Thing as Bad, reading it everywhere. I actually just pulled it off my bookshelf. I want to read this again because it's so encouraging. So make sure to go check out Abby. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast.